evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much for coming. My name's Hannah Kay, and I'm the executive producer at Intelligence Squared. For those of you who aren't familiar with Intelligence Squared, we are the world's leading forum for live debates, talks, and discussions. We're delighted to be partnering with Selfridges in this series of six events that we've put together for their beauty project. So this evening, we're going to be putting the focus on men and male grooming. And I'd like to thank our really delightful, fabulous, and very erudite panel for coming to join us for what I'm sure is going to be a really fascinating discussion. Now it's time to hand over to our chair. He's the editor of GQ magazine, the author of Mr. Mr. Jones's Rules, which is a guide for the modern man. And he's also chair of the British Fashion Council's menswear committee. So there's really very little that he doesn't know about men's style and grooming. Please welcome Dylan Jones. Thank you. Part of the applause. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, tonight's discussion, Vanity, Thy Name is Man. This evening, we're going to be exploring uh, the ways in which men have now become keen custodians of uh, the way they look. Are men more vain now than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago? Uh, the female of the species um, has long had a reputation for vanity that has previously far exceeded that of the male. Um, however, recently um, we have become far more highly groomed and have taken to manicures and pedicures and makeup and waxing um, as though they're all going out of fashion, which they obviously aren't. Um, with our speakers this evening, uh, we're going to be exploring these themes, um, hopefully with a little help from yourselves. Um, instead of asking questions from the floor uh, right at the, uh, the end of the discussion, uh, I'll be encouraging you to um, pitch in um, at um, earlier opportunities. So please do have some questions ready. Um, I'm going to um, start by asking all of our panellists um, and introducing our panellists um, the same question. If everyone um, is positioned somewhere between 1 and 10 on the vanity scale, where do you stand? Uh, now, the first speaker I'm going to introduce um, is one of Britain's best-known um, interior designers, a national treasure. He's also a socialite, an artist, cabaret singer, uh, book reviewer, art editor, literary editor, and, and features regularly <laughs> on both the GQ and Vanity Fair best dress list, way up top. Um, please welcome Nikki Haslam. <laughs> now, Nikki, on the, and don't lie, on, a, on, a, on the vanity scale, where are you? Are you a one or a ten? Is this working? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not lying. Donny Osmond, not ice cream. I am Donny Osmond. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, and I'm going to say one. <laughs> Gasps! Gasps of disbelief! Why? Why only a one? Because I think that vanity is quite a different thing. The, the definition of vanity is conceit and conceitedness and being pleased with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I think that vanity is when you are unsure of yourself and need help and need to change your look, you're unsatisfied with yourself, and you do whatever you can to improve. Well, you've changed your look quite a lot over the years. In fact, you change your look on a, on a daily basis. You sort of reinvent yes, yourself all wanted, the time. I wanted to look like Liam Gallagher. I wanted to look like um, Steve McQueen. I wanted to look like... I didn't like the way I looked. We all and I still Steve do. McQueen. And, I, and I still don't like the way I look. I change it whenever I can. Really? And I think that's the essential thing. I got a quote here from Psalm 39. Every man in his best state is altogether vanity. Uh, well, thank you very much. I don't believe you. But uh, next, we, you. next we turn to an uh, award-winning journalist who writes for the uh, Times Saturday magazine, as well as many other places. And um, having uh, himself failed to achieve a six-pack, he has satirized men who fret about the state of their abs. Um, please welcome Robert Crampton. Um, Robert, I, uh, I can't quite believe you're as unaware as your body as you say you are, but uh, I'll ask you the same question. On the scale of 1 to 10, on the vanity scale, where are you? Where do you stand? I'm uh, going to surprise you. I think, uh, unlike uh, Nicky, who probably people thought was going to say 10, uh, 1, 10 rather, and he said 1, I would say 10, as opposed to 1. Because I think vanity is not about uh, conceit. I think it's about 
projecting yourself and looking as well as you can do. That's my desire, but I think probably for most men, the gap between the, what you want and what you achieve is, I mean, that's the point. So my desire would be a 10 and my uh, uh, actuality would be two. <laughs> yes. Too, too self-deprecating. How, how often do you buy clothes? How often do you sp go out and spend money on clothes? My wife buys my clothes. You're serious? <laughs> quite often, yeah, that's quite normal. I mean, I... Like maybe not for you people, but... <laughs> so you yeah. never go clothes shopping? No, occasionally, yeah. yeah Where occasionally. would you go? Surprise me. Air hmm, airports, mostly. <laughs> it, no, seriously, you have a bit of time in airports. Money has less value because you're on your holidays and you're sort of uh, uh, larging it up. Airports, yeah. Whatever's convenient, yeah. Sorry, Dylan, you're looking appalled. No, I, I, no I'm not appalled. I, I, almost, I almost believe you. Uh, our next panellist is the distinguished philosopher who has taught at both Oxford and Cambridge. His many books include Being Good, Lust, my favourite, Truth, and the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy. His latest book is called Mirror, Mirror, The Uses and Abuses of Self-Love. <laughs> Please welcome Simon Blackburn. <laughs> Simon, one, ten, where are you? Well, you see, being a philosopher, I have to say, this question permits of multiple readings. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're vain about one thing or another, and I'm not... Well, put it this way, when my <coughs> wife heard I was going to be part of Selfridge's beauty project, she nearly fell off her chair. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the idea of shopping in an airport, I mean, it's just... I mean, this came from a thrift store in America, which... Um, cost me, I think, $15. Um, so I think on personal appearance and grooming and beauty, I can claim to score about one. Um, I, I was going to say zero, but I do realize I do tend to take my spectacles off when I'm being photographed, seriously. <laughs> so, I, so I guess there is a little tincture there of not wishing to appear at a disadvantage. When was the last time you bought clothes? War clothes. Uh, war clothes. <laughs> no, you're wearing clothes this evening, yes. I think. So, so, so I am, yes. <laughs> My wife must have dressed me. Um, <laughs> um, I, oh, wait a minute. Yes, I, I, I bought a pair of mountaineering socks early, earlier this week. Very useful. Um, yeah. oh, okay, those clothes? Yes. Well, yeah, they are. Yeah, both of them are. Yeah. I, I can't remember their colour, um, but then they're not often seen either. Um, <laughs> Yes, um, on the other hand, as far as other things go, I might be quite vain or at least proud. I think there are lots of distinctions in this area. Adam Smith said vanity was a desire for the applause or admiration of other people, and it could turn into a, an obsession, an overwhelming desire. And it might, as Nikki said, and derive from fear, uh, fear that you're not keeping up, that you're somehow not, not up to scratch. Um, but then it turns into what might be uh, become an obsession. Um, pride, on the other hand, can be indifferent to the actual applause of other people. You can be proud of what you do because you take pleasure in having done it well, although other people don't know about it. Um, it's, not, it's got much less to do with the actual admiration of other people, much more to do with the feeling that whatever you did or whatever you are deserves their admiration, whether or not they know of it. Yeah. So there's such a thing as proper pride uh, there's no such thing as proper vanity, I don't think. Uh, but there may be degrees of vanity, and there's another close cousin in the area, self-esteem. Um, and there, I think, there is a proper degree of self-esteem. Um, if you have too little, you become sort of a worm. And as Kant, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher, said, um, if you make yourself a worm, you can't be surprised if people tread on you. Um, philosophers are quite witty sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and so proper self-esteem, I think, is important. It's important to enable people to uh, look to do things, to try to do things. So, so I find the question very confusing. Um, and since I'm very proud of that answer, I'll give myself two. 
<laughs> Simon, thank you. Uh, lastly, we turn to a biographer and critic who has a fascination for the uh, 18th and 19th century dandy. She has written widely on the uh, myth and iconography of Byron, loves Beau Brummel, and is the author of The Courtesan's Revenge, Harriet Wilson, The Woman Who Blackmailed the King. By the way, we have a Harriet Wilson who works in the syndication department of GQ. I sincerely hope it's not the same one. Uh, please welcome Francis Wilson. Um, now, Francis, I wouldn't dream of asking you how vain you are, but uh, how vain do you like your men to be, or your man to be, on a scale of 1 to 10? I, I don't like male vanity at all. I mean, I can see that it's a complicated, complicated term, but I, I find it... In incredibly unattractive. Do other women agree? You know, I really don't like even seeing a man look in the mirror. <laughs> I like, um, I like, um, I like men who, um, you know, who look rugged and natural and hairy, but, you know, obviously I've got to back the question back to you. <laughs> I don't like men who are... <laughs> um, but would you ever consider buying clothes for your partner, your husband? No, who are these wives who shop for their husbands? I'd never <laughs> think of them. There's one here. No, I never would. Really? I, I never would. And I'd buy appalling things anyway, but I, and I don't know the size of a man ever, and so I, I, get, right. it all, I get it all wrong. Mm. But, uh, but I, I think I belong in the wrong century at the moment, because, it's, because I'm, I'm so out of tune with this... Um, with, with, with this kind of new metrosexual manscaping idea of, 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 of masculinity, I'm much more comfortable in the, in the, in the 18th century where you know, there was an ugly club and, and then could kind of someone like John Wilkes, the, the politician John Wilkes said it, could take, it would take him 10 minutes to talk away his face. He was famously ugly, twisted face and cross-eyed and uh, no teeth. And um, he was my idea of, a, you know, of an astonishing-looking man. Men who didn't bathe, men who didn't have deodorant, men yeah. who smelt. The smell it would possibly be a problem. But, um, <laughs> but I do think that men have this advantage over women, and that's that women's, um, women's beauty is of a very uniform type, when I think men's beauty is a, a stranger and rarer, much harder to define thing. And... Um, and can come in lots of different forms and varieties. And I don't think that male beauty has anything whatsoever to do with um, skin cream or, or manicures or pedicures or anything. I think it's much more to do with the promise of power that a man presents as he's standing there, or the, or the melancholic pity that he excites in the, <laughs> the woman, the Byronic pity. It's power or pity, I think, is what women find beautiful in a man, certainly not... Um, not pecs or, or, you know, or, or skin care. Robert? Yeah, I, was, I, I agree. I mean, I think women have, I think the whole vanity thing is, uh, is difficult uh, for, for women. In the, in the men have got many more uh, uh, avenues to, to realise uh, vanity than, than women have. You know, men, it's to do with, increasingly to do with looks, but it's also to do with status, power, wealth, intelligence, personality. Whereas historically and pretty much still now, for women, it's the one thing, which is looks. I know. think I think in terms of men, that uh, for me, it's um, I think it's been a huge generational shift because I think if you look back 30, 34 years in the space of three magazines in 1980, there were three magazines which were launched, which were ID, The Face, and Blitz. And they were the first magazines that were properly targeting men as consumers. And, that we, and they were reflecting images of men back at themselves. And they'd never seen them before. And actually, there was men growing out of youth cults. You were a punk, you were a new romantic, you were a mod, you were this, you were something other. But nowadays, 30 odd years later, I don't think men have you're any qualms you're, you're about talking, shopping you're whatsoever. Only about England. Surely movie magazines projected beautiful men that everybody wanted to look like in the 30s and 40s, 20s, 30s and 40s. It wasn't just the, the look of the recent. It's, it's going on much longer than that. And I think you're totally wrong. I think women do admire the David Beckhams these days. They want, they want to see packs. I think it's, I think you're, I think it's, it's all gone, that thing, that, that, that it has to be rugged men. And the reason you like your rugged men is because all the other men of that period were dandies. Heathcliff and Lord Byron weren't. So they stood out. 
Yeah, I think if you take the archetype of your rugged hero, um, the opposite of that is, as I say, a lot of people who were... E even back in the 1970s, men were, uh, particularly in this country, fantastically badly dressed. Um, and I think that every woman I know appreciates the fact that women, apart from you, um, like, women like, actually... Like flares, you mean. <laughs> Women actually appreciate the fact that men take care of themselves. I think there's a difference, though, between, um, uh, between the way a man dresses and, 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 and what he does to his body and his face. I mean, I, I love a, a well-dressed man. I'm hugely appreciative of, 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 of what men wear and enjoy enormously you know, being in the company of, of well-dressed men. It's, uh, that, that's not my problem. It's uh, what, what, kind of, what I find dismaying is you know, watching Simon Cowell's face become more and more of a kind of wax effigy. And what I find sort of strange about that, about men having, you know, the work done on their faces that, um, that women would have done, is that it precisely takes away from that, um, from that promise of power that I find so attractive in male beauty. They look needy and weak. And, um, and therefore... Are modern men needy and weak? Can we um, have some input from the, uh, from the audience? Are there any needy and weak men in the audience? <laughs> Question over here. I, I do think men and boys are becoming more and more effeminate, and I find that quite unappealing. But aren't, isn't unappealing. It, uh, isn't it, uh, because, you, unappealing. You, it, because women have been t endlessly been saying, you get in touch with your feminine side, no, and now, now they're doing it. You mind about no, it? No, <laughs> that's just it. I don't want my man to be in touch with his yeah. feminine side. I, I, I want him to smell like a man and I do like the rugged well, man but I, smell, I want him to be groomed Sorry? I want him to be groomed I don't want to see hairs coming out of his nose or right. his ears I want groomed but that doesn't mean to say I don't want but you don't want him to have a facelift no I would, I would not like him to have a facelift you're asking, you're asking a lot you want, you want a, a real man but you want groomed as well I mean, it's it's absurd. Yeah, yeah, but grooming's okay, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. Keeping nose head. But the whole thing's about is male grooming. The, the chaps in the audience. That's it's quite what a the, fine what line. What the name of the <laughs> <laughs> symposium is? Do we, do, do we, uh, there's, um, there's someone over here who has a, uh, a question. I have a question. You say little boys are becoming more effeminate. So there is an underlying assumption that grooming is somehow a feminine activity. Mm. I question that. Yeah, I don't know what the panel thinks about that. Yes, I question that. I strongly disagree with that. I totally agree with you. You do. No, it's not a feminine at all. It's just, I mean, if you have a nice garden, you plant flowers to make it nicer. Why not make things better all the time? Why okay. improve? Right. My, my son, I've got a 17-year-old son, and unquestionably he is becoming more groomed than I ever was, and I was more groomed than my dad ever was. But do I think it's effeminate? Yeah, I do, actually, if I'm really honest. But what's wrong yeah. with there's that? A, what's a, wrong with that? Simon? Yeah. There's a, a groundbreaking piece of sociology here by... Thorstein Veblen, The Theory of the Leisure Class, very funny book, the only funny book ever written by a sociologist. <laughs> and um, he, he coined the term conspicuous consumption. And he thought it was a human universal that you need to show that you've got financial stability, that you're up there with your, the people you regard as your stratum in society. Um, and in some circumstances, that can mean paying almost no attention to your appearance, or that might always mean that you have to wash, but his example was the French peasant who can go around in blue overalls all his life, except on market day when he dresses up to go to market. Why? Because in his society everybody knows what he's worth to within a sou. Um, when he goes to market he's got to show that he's a good guy, that he's reasonable. Veblen contrasted that with people who are itinerant, whose status was uncertain, you didn't know what you were getting. His example was Mississippi gamblers. Uh, if you're playing the steamboats, you cover yourself in bling because you have to show that you're wealthy, that you're a good guy, that you've got credit in the bank, that you're that's, that's better than the next guy. Dressing isn't grooming. Um, but this, this, this kind of dressing like a parrot becoming a popinjay, which is all around us in this store, for example, um, that's because people are uncertain of their status. You don't know who you're talking to. If, if, you, if you'd been the, you know, the assistant deputy accountant at ICI for the last 30 years, and you're going to go on being that for the next 20 years till you've got your gold watch, you didn't have to go to Selfridges and buy yellow shirts and things, because people knew who you were. Robert. Whereas now, of course, you do. It's not because people are uncertain of their status, it's because people have got more money. Yeah, it's to do with affluence. Yeah. 
through that you know, yeah. I mean, you, you, we, it, we, in the 18th, 19th century, you had the, the Beau Brummel figure, yeah, Oscar Wilde, or whoever, they were rich people. Uh, no, were, that's absolutely Westerns. not the they case. They were all West Can I just say that? Yeah, but they them. were rich. They could afford it. In the, in the 1950s, post-war, you had the Teddy Boys, and then 60s, you had the mods, and the working class people, the normal mainstream people, got money, and they started to spend their money in the way that uh, rich people always had done. No, the Michael Can I just Michael. do it, and, and they still do. And they, but sure, in, surely it's, it's an educative process. Luck. Because if you look at men these days, they are far more sophisticated consumers than, yeah, than they were 30-odd years ago because they are shopping more like women. But actually, if you, if you take the notion of um, status, the great thing is about men who are able to buy clothes now. They can buy clothes at a very low premium, very low entry level, and they have status. They don't have to have a, a big a big job. They don't have to have a huge salary. They have status by dint of what they're wearing. Surely that's a good thing. Can I just say something about Beau Brummel here before we move on? Because it's, it's completely pertinent to what, um, what, what's been said. But Beau Brummel was, um, was someone who did use clothes, uh, clothes to shift his status. He wasn't rich. He was, he was, um, he was a lower middle class boy who managed to elevate himself in, um, in Regency's aristocratic society precisely by, get, by dressing better than the king. So the king was dressed in his pink ribbons and bows. And Beau Brummel came along and said, if John Bull turns around to look at you, then you are not well dressed. You know, clothes should be. He dressed like, he dressed like, um, he dressed like a roundhead. You know, it was plain and black and it was lots of starch and lots of linen and polished his polished his boots and wore buff trousers and a blue cutaway jacket. And it was a kind of uniform. And what, he, what Beau Brown well, managed to pull off with this look was a democracy of, of, a democracy of clothing, where someone who was, a, someone who was a lower middle class was, um, was sought after by the aristocracy because it looked good for them to be seen moving with sure. him. And so that was a really interesting moment. Okay. In, in, in the power of, of male dressing. Let's talk about... Let's, let's, Sorry, let's, Bo Brummel also said if you wear a clean white shirt, it doesn't matter what you wear. <laughs> yeah. Very good point. Still true today. Can we, can we bring it up to date and talk a little bit about the media? Is there undue pressure from the media these days for men to look better? I, I'm forever being called up by some intern who's been pressurised by their editor to call me up and accuse me of indoctrinating young men and encourage them to, to dress in a fancy way. Has the media had an undue effect and has it had a good effect, a bad effect? Robert? Uh, uh, no, the media has not had a bad effect. The media is, we're in a private sector, we respond to what the customers want. You know, we're trying to sell newspapers or magazines, in your case. So we just reflect what is happening, you know? It's a, the, the whole thing about media influence is just, it's a nonsense, you know? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a people just resort to it to say, oh, I blame the media. You know, it's just, it's, it's no, it's that, we are trying to flog magazines, flog newspapers, we reflect what people want. It's very heartening to hear that, I have to say, I must say. People on the media, much, I mean, television, look incredibly well dressed, I think, these days. They're the only people who wear ties, like you. Even Cameron doesn't wear a tie, it's disgraceful. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about, it, okay. I find it odd that somebody who works for the Murdoch Press oh. thinks that the media doesn't have an influence. I mean, Tony Blair, David Cameron, they all think that Rupert Murdoch has an influence. That's why they invite him to. Downing Street on a daily Well, basis. I don't think it's got That's anything to do to. with the, uh, not the, about the uh, proprietors. It, it's, I'm, I'm talking about the way that um, um, the image of the modern man is perpetuated through media. In terms uh, of political influence, I would entirely agree with you. Oh, right. uh, it, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about vanity, thy name is man, and how men dress. Exactly. And I don't think let's uh, let's uh, talk about one particular figure who has been extraordinarily influential in the last 15 years, particularly amongst working class men. David Beckham. Good role model, bad role model. Discuss. Nicky. Well, I, can't, I think the tattoo has gone a bit far. But he is rather wonderful, and I think, I think, I think it's amazing that he has projected himself very gently and very nicely, and he's never put a foot wrong, never done anything nasty, and I think he is a, ro a role model, and jolly well should be, much better than some of the people who've been ro like Wayne Rooney or somebody. Robert. Love David Beckham. Um, yeah. 
you won't hear a word said against it. Fantastic. 115 caps for England, really good. But, um, <laughs> very well dressed, good football as well. Won't hear a word said against Wayne Rooney either. Yeah, yeah. Like Simon. Me. David who? <laughs> He's not a philosopher, but uh, David Beckham, good thing or bad thing? Okay. Um, I have no idea. I've never met the gentleman. I think he's a very good footballer. I've been told that. Uh, and other than that, I know nothing whatsoever. But oh, he's got a wife who I, 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 I'm always so sorry for. She's su such an anorexic. But um, that's her problem, not his. Francis. Oh, I, I love watching David Beckham. And I, I mean, he's, he's, he's very interesting. The way in which you remember his hairband when he had long hair and he wore that hairband when he was playing football. And this sarong. He's a person who sort of brought in a lot. He's really feminized masculinity in a, in a, in a, a brave and outrageously interesting way. I think, yeah, he's an interesting person to live in the same time as, as sartorially. You talk about um, your sort of archetype, a man who um, is perhaps more rugged, perhaps comes from um, uh, a more Neanderthal time. Um, but I think that, do we, do we now castigate men for not being vain? Because they have access to better clothes, because they're meant to look better, because they're meant to smell better, because there is as much peer pressure these days for men to, uh, to look better amongst other men, not amongst women, uh, other women. Do we castigate men for not being vain? I think we absolutely do. Yeah? Yes. Can you, can you expand upon that a well, little? I was thinking just then when you were talking, I mean, possibly isn't the right example. I was remembering um, the way in which uh, Michael Foote was pilloried for wearing donkey jackets. Well, he looked dreadful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, it wouldn't have occurred to him to wear anything else. It wasn't a sign of disrespect. He just wasn't a, it wasn't a person who was particularly interested in, in going shopping. But I, I just want to make a distinction. Um, it's an 18th century distinction that I think is quite important to, um, to put in place here. And that's about male beauty and the way in which um, I'm distinguishing between um, um, you know, the sort of two types of male beauty, the rugged beauty and the, um, and the, kind of, and the skin cream beauty. And that's the, um, the picturesque and the spline. And in, in the 18th century, the picturesque was what was smooth and what was safe, you know, a picturesque landscape with smooth and safe hills, and a sublime landscape would be the Alps. It would be sort of rugged and terrifying, and something that would fill you with awe and fear when you looked at it, when a picturesque landscape would make you feel calm and smooth. And I think that they're two very, uh, they're, they're, two kinds of, uh, they're two kinds of beauty, and I prefer the sublime. And I think David Beckham's interestingly moving between them both. But surely the sublime of beauty was, was, was the Greek statues and the, Ren the Renaissance and the, um, Baroque, Baroque carvings, they are the super, supreme looks of a man's body. Yes. The, 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 the rugged was the goat, the satyr, the raper. That's oh. a different, the, the, the frightening person. That Robert. The, that was That's the a yeah. yeah. I don't know, I don't know. I've been thinking about this a lot, whether that would be, whether the, um, the classical, Greek, classical Greek beauty would be sublime or picturesque. And one thing I did think, though, is the, be the beauty of small boys. Now, the, be the be boy yeah, beauty is sublime there. because it's... <laughs> the boy beauty is sublime it's, because... It's, it's only 20 to 8. <laughs> Robert, I think you wanted to uh, interject there, uh, so to speak. Moving on from small boys, uh, <laughs> the thing about Beckham was that he combined the traditionally masculine in that he was a good footballer with the... I mean, he's sort of, I'm agreeing with you. So we combine those two, which is why he's been such a tremendous uh, icon. You know, he, he was he combined the traditionally masculine, the rugged, i.e. football, uh, with, I can't remember what you said, but, you know. The sarong and the hairband. Correct, yeah, yeah. That's why Beckham's been such an icon. But he only did those two things. And you, you, we all go on as if every single person, every single man in the room is a groomed man. Surely the whole world is there with some groomed men and some rough men. I mean, yes. let's, let's, let's not worry about but it. But he combined the two. We must That's we what want I to do with myself, which I happen not to want to do. You uh, mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, jokingly a couple of minutes ago about David Cameron not wearing a tie. How do we expect our politicians to look these days? Are we wary of them if they're too well groomed? I don't know. I was with William Astor, his father-in-law, the, watching the royal wedding. Sam came holding hands and had no hat on and he was, the tie was over. And William Bass said, he's not even wearing a tie pin. <laughs> so, you can't please everybody. 
Robert, how should our politicians look, our male politicians? It's a bit forced, isn't it, when you see Cameron without a tie and you see Clegg without a tie, and you, you know that they're kind of trying to make a certain impact. But I'm, on balance, I'm in favour of it. I think the tie is, and no disrespect to you, but a tie's had its day. Fine. Whilst we're arguing about neckwear, does anyone from Sorry. the audience um, have a... We do. We have some questions over there for our panellists. Back to the discussion in regards to, you know, vanity and masculinity and men becoming a little bit more feminine in that retrospect. I mean, I think it's really more of a cultural question. I mean, myself, I'm half Italian, half Dominican. In Italy, a man who takes care of himself, who grooms himself, it's a sign of self-respect. It's, it's bella figura. It's how you demonstrate yourself and part of sprezzatura displayed. While in the Dominican Republic, it's a very macho society. Men are anticipated to have a wife and several lovers, but they're obsessed with fragrances and polishing their shoes. And it's called tigarismo. Yeah. So, and they're considered extremely masculine, you know, despite the fact that they maybe appear dandy. So I really think that's a very cultural question with that retrospect. That's all. I agree. There was, a, there was another hand in, in that direction. If you look at politicians and, and and the way they dress when they're out of office, it's, it's often a little bit more informative. If you look at Tony Blair since he's left number 10, he's dressing in much more chic suits. He's gone yeah. bespoke. You know, he, he's, he's, if you see his jet dressing at he's public events... He's got much events, more money. Yeah, he's got, well, he's got, yeah he, he's allowed to show it now in a way that his handlers before wouldn't have allowed him to do so because he had to project a certain kind of frumpy, kind of every manish image, which the elected politician somewhat needs to embody um, for various you know, reasons of propaganda or whatever. So you can see once he's left office what he, how he really wants to project himself without kind of the, the mantle of office mm -hmm. you know, uh, putting yeah. him into a certain box. I think in that case you have to look though below the superficial coxcomb to find the real coxcomb underneath. <laughs> but when, uh, when Blair was Prime Minister he earned about 140 grand a year. Yeah. And now he earns, what, three mil a year? So it, it might just be a function of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but funnily, what, what, the, what, what ma the perfectly dressed man people think of, sort of Savile Row, is Anthony Eden's look. He, he wore it all the way through his premiership. So it's just sort of trying to... It's playing to the masses. That he was independently that. rich, though, wasn't he? Well, you don't have to be rich to be well-dressed. I don't understand what no, the problem with ties is. If I was a man, I'd be dressed. wearing a different tie every day. It'd be wonderful to wear ties. Uh, what, what? Thank you, Francis. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it's the only bit of you that you can choose for yourself. I mean, otherwise, I'd feel a bit sorry for men, actually. They're not so good on women. <laughs> no, exactly. But, um, you know, it's, the, it's, a, it's, your, it's your brand, isn't it? It's a sign of, a, a sign of your, the way in which you're making that look your own. Quite possibly. Peter York has a question for someone on the panel, I hope. Is it's very large a class issue because... Uh, inhibition about being smart and looking good, historically, I mean in the, re you know, the 20th century, w increased as you went up the class scale. People, we were almost unique in the world and having that great inhibition that other people in happier, luckier, warmer times um, absolutely didn't have, of being anti-visual. Uh, until very recently, this was an anti-visual nation. So showing any respect for the visual over the verbal meant that there was something thoroughly wrong with you. And for working class kids who've got to make their way in the world, a bit of, anyway, a bit of sharp, a bit of style, in the same way that um, for black kids in America's ghettos, a bit of sharp and a bit of style, was an obvious way to express yourself. So it's that particular contempt for looking good is a is a middle-aged and older upper middle class English thing. It doesn't Sh apply. Peter, in the rest Peter of the surely world. blue jeans got rid of the of the class system in clothes. Well, you would hope so, but well, it, it did. did. Everybody wears blue jeans from top to bottom. Robert, I think Peter's right, but I think I don't think that's. Uh, I think you're right from about the 1960s onwards with the mods and the uh, and then. Uh, when people have money, basically, when the majority of people had money, I think you're right. I mean, even now, I mean, I'm from the north of England, and you would, uh, and I live in the East London, and what people wear in East London, which is a, apparently, supposedly uh, hip, 
if they tried to get into a club in the north, where I'm from, they would be denied entry because they wouldn't be considered to be smart enough. Yeah? These, these are the infamous hipsters, yeah? Yeah. Heritage yeah. hipsters. Yeah. Or well, hipsters. Went, and if they went into a club in Manchester or Liverpool or Hull or Newcastle, they, the Dortmund would say, no, sorry, mate, you're not smart enough. One of the hipsters went, went out in the 70s. What do you mean no. about hipsters? Uh, it's, it's, a new, it's, a, it's a new generic. I was, in, I was in Shoreditch one Sunday morning just before Christmas with my 13-year-old daughter, and she came up to me and said, Daddy, I've got it. I know what you have to... I've, I've got the list of what you need to, to be, to wear, to carry, to be a hipster. And it was a beard, it was oh, a mobile see, a whole, phone, look, it right. was round glasses, a bicycle, used a backpack. To, to and there, phones, and yeah. there were 10 of these. Yeah. There were 10 of these. And about 20 minutes later, she rushed up to me in the shop and said, Daddy, I've just seen a 10. Yeah. <laughs> Where was that shortage? Yeah, yeah that's of course sort of, it was. Sort of the foggy look. But I think that the thing that um, it's very easy to forget is that, uh, for, certainly for British men, in the uh, second half of the 20th century, it was all about safety in numbers because we all loved wearing a uniform. Whether you went to work in a factory, whether you crossed Waterloo Bridge every morning in a bowler hat, uh, whether you dressed in Savile Row, men bought a uniform, which is why the city collapsed about 10 years ago when uh, we, br we tried to bring in, lots of the big banks tried to bring in Dress Down Friday. Mm. And every Friday, a man who worked in a financial institution was told that he could wear what he liked to work. And of course, he's completely flummoxed men. They did not know what to wear to work. So men would turn up in Wellington boots. <laughs> corduroy trousers before they were fashionable. Um, men just did not know what to do. And so after about 18 months, this was reversed and people were in, men were encouraged to wear unif uh, uniforms again, to wear a suit to work. Can I just take what issue with one thing you said? I, I don't think it's because the British generally or the British upper classes have no visual sense. It's just they, 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 uh, they put their visual sense, their visual discriminations into things like gardens and parks. Their houses and gardens and parks would look lovely. They'd go around in shabby old tweed suits with you know, leather patches in the elbows and so it's forth. Very um, but that in itself, that <laughs> exactly. in, that, that in itself oh, is a look, isn't it? I didn't deny that. I just said that's the way it went. It was, they've got no, the, it's not true that they've got no visual sense. Just put, just put a, a, a lot of upper class people or with um, a set of new coordinates in terms of the way they fix up uh, houses, architecture, then they're absolutely at sea. Do you know, their, their visual thing doesn't go very far. You look like you wanted to interject then. No, no, I was listening to every word being said. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a very, very few of, those, of that sort of tweedy patched look. I mean, dukes do it and dustmen. But there's not much in between. They try, the people try and look smarter these days, don't they? And they buy one. I think the British, the British men, the young boys, you see, when you get a top man at lunchtime on Friday when they've got their wages, you can't believe how wonderful they look. Uh, it's, it's astonishing. I think the British are the best. And you walk down the King's Road, I, I see, but I want to wear, wear exactly what that guy's wearing. Not like your daughter in the one to ten. I'd rather look like a boy from Shoreditch. <laughs> I, but my, Simon. Senior, my senior common room in Cambridge has several Nobel Prize winners and everything like that. And believe me, they don't look great on a Friday. <laughs> they, look, they have the tweed suits. Universities, and, universities are famously bad in dress. Probably look, they probably look better than they think they do. But except, that's because their status except is... Except for Oxford Bag. That's Who'd, because their status is marked in other ways, which is the very sure. point. Hmm. Who do we think is the vainest man in Britain? <laughs> well, I don't I guess it has to be David Beckham. Why do you guess he's not vain? That's a... Oh, he's not, not according to your definition of vanity. No. But he's a man who thinks um, all, almost non-stop about his appearance, doesn't he? I mean, it's not irrelevant to him. Simon, famous man in Britain. Well, if vanity shades into conceit and narcissism, I think it's got to be Tony Blair. This is good, Robert. <laughs> Beat that. Uh, I was always, I interviewed William Hague a few years ago. <laughs> Doesn't sound very vague, uh, uh, vain, does he, William Hague? But he spends, because uh, he can, and maybe because he needs to, <laughs> he spends three grand on a suit, hey, which I don't know to anybody else, but that sounds like quite a lot to me. So even though he maybe doesn't look as good as Beckham or even Blair, 
I said William Hay. But good luck to him anyway. I'm not criticising him for that. <laughs> Nicky. It's the hardest question ever. I mean, I don't think, as it, from my definition, it's not, it's not easy to say. It's sort of proud, pe not proud. Well, not a, okay, not in a pejorative way then. No. I, just think, I think that David Beckham, and uh, David Cameron's pretty vain because he just thinks he's completely wonderful. Russell <laughs> <laughs> well, Brown's pretty vain, isn't he? Um, yeah, yeah, can we, can yeah, we that, please Russell have Brown's some great. more... Can we please have some more questions from the audience for our illustrious panel? We have a, a question over here. I found it rather shocking, actually, that Francis talked about self-expression being related to the necktie, whilst you all sort of debated the utilitarian purpose of it. And I was just wondering if you think that occurred to me right away when you said, oh, a necktie's had its day. I thought, well, it's self-expressive. So I just wonder if that's a female, uh, you know, you could assign that to a female point of view on, on vanity and, and what you put into your dress. None of you have mentioned it. You've stuck to status and power and things like that. If you take your tie off, then you're wearing the uniform. Right. It's the tie that makes it the independent look. No, I think that if you look, it was uh, referenced earlier on, if you look at the, uh, the history of youth culture in this country from the 1950s onwards, it was all about self-expression at the expense of, any, of anything else. You wore clothes because you wanted to express yourself, because you weren't part of something. You were re rebelling against something. And then it got to the stage where you were rebelling against other people who were rebelling against something. So I think it's all about self-expression. And in that respect, it's a very, very male conceit, not a, not a female one. Do we have more questions? It's a question to the panel, but also to maybe some men in the audience. Um, Tom Ford and Mark Jacobs have just released makeup lines for men. But I'd be interested to know how many men in this, in this room would happily wear concealer, guy liner, manscara? Is that something that you, is, is, it, is it in your, it's, it's real, but it is, is it in your cupboards? Or will it be in five years time, do you think? Can we have a show of hands? A show of hands? One. <laughs> Two. I, I simply don't believe it. Well, I, I use a concealer. That's it. Don't they use, everybody uses that awful called moisturizer. Okay, can I... The, the three men on our panel, you do, you admit it, yes? I, I admit to using concealer or bronzer. Because I, I want to look well, I don't want to look... Well, they're two different things, aren't they? Well, I'm, well I'm, I thought a bronzer was, a, was a, some sort of fake, and then the, fake tan. Yeah, and I put, if I've got a spot, I put concealer on it. You don't have spots. Just, I've just, never seen you with a spot, Nikki. Is that because you wear concealer? concealer? Okay, fine. <laughs> Robert, do you, yeah, are you I, aghast at the idea, or no, would you? No, no. I, I, if I've got a spot, I would put concealer on it. You would? Yeah. I would wear bronzer, but then I'd get on a sunbed, so I don't need to. <laughs> uh, no bad. Guy either. liner, no, I wouldn't do that. I did that in about 1981, near Romantics. Yeah, I did yeah. that then, but that was, that was then, and I was 17 and now I'm 49, so... Wouldn't do it now, but yeah, it's it's fine, and it, my son might well do it, and if he did, then that's cool. Ain't got a problem with it. Simon, guy liner. <laughs> I, I feel I've suddenly peered into a new and deeper abyss, a, cir <laughs> a, cir a circle of hell that I had no no conception of before the, this evening. So no. <laughs> Francis, what do you think about men uh, wearing very, very obvious makeup? I think uh, men in eyeliner look absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mark Boland in the 70s. Oh, Mark Boland was really good looking. <laughs> yes, exactly. All eyeliner can only look good on either side. <laughs> okay. Certain sort of guy looks great in makeup. Mark well, Boland being one. What sort of guy doesn't look good in makeup? Keith Richards. Me, me. If I look at photos of me now from, like, as I mentioned, 1981, when I was working that new romantic look, I looked shit. I looked terrible. You yeah. should have brought one along and let yeah, us be the judge. Your, Simon. Your general practitioner wouldn't look good in makeup, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think we have to say something about Russell Brand here because I think we're all agreed that he's the vainest man Russell, yeah, Russell, in England. Russell Brand is brilliant. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and there's a Good amount of guy liner going on there. Yeah, but he's, he, what, and he, he suits that look. He looks fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So, but you said yeah. you didn't like vain men. Yeah. I don't. Russell Brand is a complete. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> Russell Brand. 
I think you've completely <laughs> altered your opinion from, <laughs> from, 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 from 50 minutes ago. <laughs> I wouldn't ago. go out with Russell Brand. <laughs> oh, obviously, I'd be so lucky. But, uh, no, but he's a, he's is this an advertisement? <laughs> <laughs> but Russell Brand, I think, is the kind of... He is also the kind of Bo, Bo Brummel, Byron, yeah. third sex type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Bo Brummel dressed down, as you said earlier. He, he got rid of all the, the, the pinks and the blues of the Regency and wore only brown and beige. Does it matter? Does it matter if uh, we're on this... Say that men are on this journey now. Does it matter that men are going to become vainer? Because men will become more vain. The, you, you were talking about your son, Robert. Yeah. Uh, where the, the, the sort of half a generation above him have no qualms about uh, going shopping. Yeah. Um, he will have no qualms about um, wearing makeup, and God knows what the next generation of men It's a are matter going. of degree, isn't it? If, if it means that he becomes absolutely narcissistic and he's sort of obsessed with his body image in a way that some uh, women are, or some young girls are, in a, in a negative unhealthy, uh, destructive way, then it's a bad thing. If it means that he's uh, more uh, concerned with his appearance than I ever was, and his hygiene, and his, and his look, then it's a good thing. As far as, I can see, as far as I can see, most men are turning into drag queens now anyway. So. <laughs> Sorry. Most men are turning into drag queens. Most we, men we are turning into drag queens. I mean, Where are they? I can see them out there. On the telly. Oh, I see. I was going to look at these Can you give me some examples, please, Nicky? Men Nikki? love drag these days. It's so embarrassing. We've always loved drag in this country. Uh, uh, can we wind back? Can you give us some examples of men who are drag queens now? <laughs> well, well, I mean... I don't see any in this room. No, but I mean, there are so many the accepted drag queens. Of the new, it's the new fashion, that man that won the Eurovision Song Contest. There are masses of people like that. There's one. Which, well, there, there are lots there's one man who won there, the Eurovision lots, Song Contest. There's lots of them. There are, uh, open, open your eyes, open your papers, open, your, uh, open the magazines. There are lots of guys who would wear beards and wear drag. Okay. I have a question for the panel. I was wondering, and I'm a historian and a psychologist as well, and I was wondering if you think there's a new dandism uh, at the moment, I mean, this kind of early century, uh, 21st century, like there was Lord Byron, Oscar Wilde, etc. They were, you know, they, they had a style. And uh, all the romantics also, of course, La Martine, etc. There was a dandism there. So I was wondering if you think there's a new form of dandism. You talked about Russell Brand. He has a kind of appearance, etc. The panel, Can we what just do we dismiss think? this idea that, that Lord Byron was a dandy? He was very, very badly dressed, a dwarf and stank. <laughs> <laughs> Robert. Yeah, I agree. I, th I mean, I don't want to sound all kind of Marxist about this, but I think it's, yes, I think it's to do with money. Accepting what you said about Bo Brummel and leaving aside the... Uh, 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 Bo Nash. Uh, exceptions. I think it's largely to do with uh, uh, money and changing uh, taste. So generally speaking, I think it's been probably for 200 years, it used to be rich people, the old individual, and now it's the majority of men, and I think that's, yes, that's happening and it's a good thing. The men are more concerned about fashion and appearance and that's clearly a good thing and it's largely to do with uh, affluence. Simon? Well, as I've already said, I'm not sure it is all largely to do, do with affluence. I think it's much more to do with the slightly rootless and uncertain status that people have in society and I think as an anthropologist you'd probably recognise that as the, the, the root cause um, because in other times, if you've got money, you spend it on other things, like your children, or your houses, or your gardens. Um, you have to show it on your body. You have to show it in bling and in sort of absurd clothing and Swiss watches and so on, only if you need to show off constantly on display. So it's a display thing. Francis? Uh, but as far as that goes, I think it's a human universal. I mean, you find combs and mirrors in Bronze Age burials. And yeah. the Popinjay or Coxcomb is a figure in Jacobean drama, for example. What do you think, Francis? I, I don't think that Dante ever went away. I mean, there's a new. I mean, there's, there's very obviously a kind of um, a, a look being paraded at the moment. But there's, they've always been, they've always been dandies. There's always been a male aesthetic. I think uh, for my my two penneth is that I think it's uh, these days it's uh, uh, an, an accepted uh, um, means of self uh, self expression and is no longer considered to be in any way 
um, odd, whereas I, I think it, uh, it um, used to be. Someone's mobile. Oh, we have one, one question over here. We've probably got a time for a, uh, um, a couple more. Actually, it was um, two questions. First question was for you, Dylan. I'm just wondering how many out of 10 Simon would score as a hipster. Um, seems to score quite well from where I'm sitting. 10. The, obviously, uh, obviously it's the, the second obviously question it's was slightly more serious. Uh, does the panel think it's a good thing? Men are getting more vain. Isn't, just, isn't it just part of feminism, equality between the sexes? I guess I'm interested. Is it, it's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, I'd like to know how many girls or boys in the audience like going to bed with or going out with or being with a, 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 a groomed, an ultra groomed man. Basically. We have a we have a question, I think, here, and then I think, I think we're going to have to uh, to close. I keep bringing things back to culture, but I think again that it's a cultural thing about hanging out with an ultra groomed man. I mean, but also it's common sense. The person, for example, he's ultra groomed, but he's a cool guy, and you can talk to him and whatnot. Who cares? But he's ultra groomed, and he's a total jerk. And of course, you want to go yeah. away. But I mean, in Italy, every men tend to be very well groomed, and you wouldn't put that at you know. It's common to hang out with them, but they could be a total, as we say in the States, douche, or they could be a total <laughs> a cool guy. So it depends. Yeah. Any, any other questions? No? No? Oh, you've got one more here. Yeah. One more. Final question, please. Sorry, it's, it's not, a, not a general one, because it's, uh, it's actually oh. aimed at Nikki, who's the one person on the panel, who I know has changed his appearance totally several times in my memory. And the Liam Gallagher phase was fantastic. Um, it was. Yeah, yeah, but Seminal. Uh, Valerie, I just like looking up to date. I don't, I, I don't change my appearance. I, I have had a face lift because I wanted to look well up. But, but I don't case, change my appearance. I change the persona I'm in at that moment. Yeah, I mean, I wanted case, to be Elvis Presley, who didn't when I was young. I'd have done it. I wanted to be a cowboy. I've done it, done it all, done it all. So what, be what a, are you now? I mean, I, could be, I can't... Is that be, your question? I well, I can't... I was it. aiming at the Harrison Ford look, if you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers tonight. Um, Nikki and Simon will be um, signing copies of their um, books afterwards. I'd like to thank Intelligence Squared and Seraphitis for hosting tonight, but um, most of all, I'd like to thank our incredibly smartly dressed and well-groomed audience. So thank you very much indeed, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.